Well, uh, good morning. Welcome to a quick conversation about Proud Monster Deluxe. Uh, oh, it's pretty early this morning, and this game has been on my mind. We've been playing it uh, quite a bit, but not necessarily making what I would call your rapid progress with it. And and you might wonder why that is. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, we, we set... I'll, let me give you a little background about the play and what's gone on. And then we'll talk about the game. And this is not really a review because I haven't played it enough to really be qualified at all to make any informed comments. I can only give you some impressions based on my experiences to date uh, with the game the rules and interactions with the designer. <clears throat> so we set the game up, play the first turn as a let's work out the, the combat rules and the air and how things all work and kind of get gelled together. So there's a couple of a couple of good hours there, plus the setup time on Vassal. And then we went, oh yeah, okay, well, that, that, now I see how I might want to set things up as the Germans a little differently, and as the Soviets, I might want to set things up a little differently. And so we reset, played three turns, uh, and they, they each took about two hours a turn on Vassal, uh, maybe, maybe a little more. And then we ended up with a German auto victory uh, at, at some point in the game, either the third turn or the fourth turn, I forget what it was. And then uh, we said, gee, that was interesting. Uh, let's swap sides and let's see if the other person can play the Soviets differently. And if then we'll learn more of now that we know more about how the game system works, let's try and you know get after it and have a look. <clears throat> and then, you know, the Soviet player can play the Germans and he might have some different ideas as well. So we get started and we play the first turn of that. And uh, then we played the second turn, and we'll start at the second turn, perhaps. And the uh, and the designer tuned in, and he, he watched us play, and had some comments and, and whatnot, and uh, didn't necessarily seem particularly comfortable with his own rules. But that's beside the point, because you know he designed it forever ago, so who knows, right? And he had a had to have a copy of him in front of, of the rules in front of him, and I'm sure he's designing a dozen other things. So that's neither here nor there. But here's the here's the thing: as we got into the as we got into the game, right? You, you start looking at it, and you go, "Wow, okay, beautiful components." Uh, the black and white rule book, which is, I guess, de rigueur for the the time this was designed. Some relatively nice charts. The setup charts are kind of that's kind of an eye chart, right? That's pretty pretty hefty looking and lots of detail kind of spread around a little difficult to, to work with same for this Soviet chart nice big turn charts and all the rest of it and while we were playing uh, you know I had a lot of people asking me questions about well, well it looks like you're having a lot of fun with that game and we were having fun and people say well do you like it and I was like well I don't know because I haven't got far enough into the game and here's a look at the maps right I think you've all probably seen these you can see them online uh, the maps are pretty nice. They're a little bland, but they're pretty nice. I'm not a huge fan of the artwork for the for the, what defines a major city because that's not a fortress; that's a major city. Uh, but it's when you start digging into the details and re uh, realizing that there's a, there's a little more to the game, first of all, and there's uh, there's some things that could possibly go sideways, and there's tons of counters, and they're all fabulous. You know, let me zoom in here on these guys. You know, you can see nice detail on them and they're clean and crisp and they're large five-eighths and the hexes are all large and five-eighths and they're all, it's all very nice. There's 10 counter sheets or something like that. So, uh, so it, you know, the design, and here's the warning, right? The designer says, you're going to need to play this game 10 times to uh, to really get the, get the hang of it. And, and and get all find all the tricks and all the Easter eggs and all the little nuances and things like that. And I've had this game for a long time. I've had it since it came out. And uh, I always thought I'm not setting up a three map uh, game and ten sheets of counters to play ten times to work out 
what the freaking special sneaky bits are. A game needs to be digestible and understandable. And we, we, if there's nuance in there, that's one thing, right? That's fine. That's that's ex, extra play will deliver nuance. I, I totally get that. But just because a rule is worded a certain way, then doesn't immediately jump out at you, or how its application could be applied doesn't immediately jump out to you. That now we're starting to get into that gray line that I start to worry about. About what 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 are we really trying to do here? Are we trying to show how clever you are as a designer, or are we trying to represent a game and, and a system and an experience in a given front to allow us to explore your intent? And if I need to play it ten times to do that with ten sheets of counters and three maps. I'm not sure that I'm the right guy for that game. So that was the warning I got, right? And silly me, thank goodness we're playing it on Vassal. So on Vassal, it's easy just to reset. And and the game certainly does play relatively quickly. I will say that uh, once you know most of the rules. And and here's where things start to get a little, a little difficult for me. Uh, I guess this is kind of cut to the chase about the rules. There's some wording in some of these rules and the bits and pieces are spread around such that it's difficult to understand what is really meant by certain things. And I'm just going to use maybe just two examples. And the first is the odds table. Um, I, I posted on Facebook about the the wording for the rule for, for combat and I'll, I'll bring it up here on the screen so you can see it. And this 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 was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back for me. And and it could both just be that uh, myself and those that I have shared this with have uh, are not capable war gamers. There's absolutely that. I am not saying that I am not the I am the smartest cookie in the in the jar as they say but here's the here's the odds right so you read that and you go oh uh you calculate the odds and uh you you move your you you move your uh, final you get you uh, applied and the final odds column is determined and so in the word the final odds column right so i would go to the crt and i let's see if i've got it here i may have Away. Please be here. Here it is. And uh, I look at the CRT and I go, okay, it is a. Zoom out. Can you zoom out? Oh, you worry out. It goes from one to three to seven to one. And then the bottom left hand side, under this kind of heavily worded chart, is uh, all odds are greater than seven to one, are treated as one to five, as a one five uh, loss. So. You know, eight to one, nine to one, ten to one. I guess whatever they are, I treated it seven to one. I treated it uh, one five. So when I read this, and it says uh, it says uh, applied, and the final odd column, odds column determined. Well, seven to one is the final odds column. So seven to one plus or minus the two shifts maximum that you're allowed to have means that I can go from. Uh, you know, I guess if I add seven to one and I get a plus one shift, I can go up to eight to one and that's when I get this auto result, right? With no die roll required. Or I will uh, go down, maybe it's a two column shift, I'll go down two columns to five to one. Well, that's not how it works, uh, apparently. How it works is that if I have 20 to one against you, I go down, if I'm going down two columns, I go down from 20 to 19 to 18. And then that means it's automatically an 8 to 1 result. And you roll, you don't need to roll, and it's just a 1 5 result. I, I'm i not sure. I started to, because this got to be in my bonnet. And I, and I got really, really hot under the collar about this. Because at this point, we've put 20 plus hours collectively into this, maybe even more. And here I find that all that play basically has been wrong. Because we were just saying, okay, yeah, what's well, max odds? And then we drop down two columns like I have done in any other 
game that I have played. I don't recall, unless it's been explicitly called out, which this is not explicitly called out, uh, that you you max odds, get your odds, and then you net it out beyond the scope of the combat results. So, so that was a that was a, a fundamentally difficult thing for me to deal with. There were a handful of other uh, things similar to that. The the concept that a large town is a large town and not clear terrain for mobile assaults uh, is one thing, and that but that a major city is clear terrain for mobile assaults, and I can choose to use either the Stalin line defenses if they happen to be in there, or the major city defenses which happen to be in there and get either a one column shift to the left or a two column shift to the left. I think that's I think that's what the rule is. Although I don't believe there are any Stalin line defenses in a major city. They are there's one in a fortress. And I don't know why I would use the Stalin line defenses in a heavy fortress because a heavy fortress gives extra penalties to the attacker. But nevertheless there's terrain in there because apparently and it's because of the size of the hexes, this style line had to go in there. <coughs> so there's this confusion over this clear terrain concept, which is not readily apparent, once again, in the wording of the rules that, that I or my game partner could figure out. And it was certainly in his best interests to work that out. And then there's this concept around close assaults. Uh, and there's this, there's this little nuance with close assault resolution that uh, talks about uh, two and a half steps or more. I'm just gonna find the little results table. I think it's back, gonna be up here somewhere. Uh, yeah, this uh, close combat loss procedure. This uh, right here, two to three and a half steps forces a step loss, right? Um, you know, a close combat is something that you can uh, elect to do into a major city, which is always going to be a close assault, a close assault, close combat, which is also another another layer of complication you put over the top of the the the, uh, the major city terrain. What what sort of terrain really is it? Uh, close combat. Uh, so you can declare a hex to be a close combat hex. And then you use this results as table based off of whatever comes on this result. So if it was a 2-0, right, or let's use something more realistic, a 2-1, right? Uh, depending on how many defender losses there were, so from 0 to 1, the, the defender, the attacker would only would lose no steps unless there was some other stuff in the hex. Uh, and in heavy fortresses, everything's going to be doubled for losses. Uh, meaning you would lose one there. And then two and a half to three and a half steps, you'll you'll lose it. You'll have to lose a step as as the attacker, uh, or you take the result that's on the CRT, which is ever higher. So it's getting a little funky there. Well, that's all well and good, and you you kind of get used to that after a period of time, and you work out this stuff. Well, the reason why there are these brigade units scattered all over the map is that you know two and a half steps or more. Is that right, or is it three and a half? Maybe it's the three and a half. When we were talking about it, I could have sworn he said it was two and a half. But three and a half steps or more in us for the Soviets defending is going to force a step loss on the Germans. So what you're supposed to do as one of the nuances of the game is have in critical areas or important areas or places where you want to you know, uh, make it painful is force that minimum step loss if it's close assault. And I believe there must be something else in the rules that says that if it's two and a half steps. Oh, that's right, that's right. So there's that, it's over here. There's this little uh, results, no, that's not it. There's this other uh, thing to work out if you take losses or not as the German, because you can see, you probably saw in the CRT, there's a lot of losses. Every, every combat has Every combat has a, uh, a pretty much a loss for the attacker, right? So here, this is where you can reduce the losses for your 
as the attacker. Well, here's the important point number five. Uh, and then the wording here is a little wonky, but um, any access artillery caused after any access artillery caused step losses, the defender lacks sufficient units to take two and a half step losses if they did not retreat or two step losses if they retreated. So that qualifier up here, if all of these are true, you don't have to take that one step loss as the German attacker or as the Soviet attacker, right? Mainly the, this is for the Germans, I think. Um, but it's only if all these things are true. So if you're attacking into clear or forest, and if you kill at least three units, and if you kill um, three steps, and if you kill, you know, and you're doing it in the dry, and you forced at least two and a half step losses, you don't, you don't take this loss. So that's kind of funky. So that, that caused a few uh, eyebrows to raise. Now let's go back to this little thing over here. This close assault business. And this is this table is not unfortunately is not on a chart anywhere. Here it is. Here. Close close assaults can also be laid in against an empty hex. And I was like, well, why why would you want to do that? Well, you get to move an extra hex, you get to advance after combat, so it gets you across a river or whatever. And I said, well, that's kind of gamey. And the response was, well, it's not gamey. It's it's to give the Germans an opportunity to you know be successful and. Uh, you know, get to uh, Moscow and win the game or whatever. And uh, it gives the Soviets an opportunity later in the game to do the same thing. And uh, it, and then someone piped up and said, well, you know, hey, Kevin, it's a, it's a reflection of uh, operational efficiency or tactical prowess. And uh, the, the Germans had it early in the war and the Russians had it later in the war. Okay, that's funky. I see. Okay. That's another thing to think about then, isn't it? And the game is is literally leavened all through the rules. There are little things like that that you've got to keep track of and keep note of in, in these rules. And what, what is ostensibly a very straightforward set of rules? It, you know, you move, you do mobile assaults, you assault... You, you have your combat, you, uh, you uh, have reserve movement, the enemy's reserve movement, and then you have your reserve movement, and then you go, uh, the, the Soviet player will do his turn, and then you go to the second week of the turn, and you'll have this wonderful little thing going on. And it all starts to get really creaky and hard because you are buried in this rule book trying to work this shit out. And someone went to the trouble of trying to, to lay out all the CRT shifts. Look, this is all the different CRT shifts and all the exceptions that go with them. Um, some combat examples in here. Uh, this is a special, con this, this is for the gas line. Uh, the gas, uh, I shouldn't call it the gas line. The guard, G-A-S-T. It's a supply, the limit of the supply line. Uh, all the different nuances around stacking. So, you know, someone created a 10 or 8 page uh, supply effects and supply attrition and all this, but uh, set of summary rules to try and work this out. And the, the challenge I have here is that, you know, I want to get into the middle of the game and the end of the game to work out how does it really play when in turns there are 60... 70 plus counters being placed on the map uh, as the Soviet reinforcements come on and, and is it even possible for the Germans to fight their way through that, you know, because I really think I potentially think that this sort of layered uh, two, two hex deep kind of, or three hex deep kind of one unit, one unit, one unit one unit in a, in a wall around Moscow would probably slow down or kill any, any real offensive but are there enough units to do that and kind of stop this? Kind of like in the Dark Valley, how folks have worked out how to break that game, right? Uh, so I, I don't. So in speaking about the game in total, I can't really say whether the campaign game really works. And it's interesting that the 
the uh, the designer has only played the full campaign three or four times or four or five times uh, as a play test, which makes me kind of nervous. But nevertheless, there's there's this challenge here trying to assess whether something is awesome or not but it's got a good you know the decision space is good in this it's kind of the right scale uh you obviously understand your role there's a little, some uh, effort to be to have limited intelligence even though the vassal module doesn't support it in that you know let it look at stacks and stuff like that um the player objectives are interesting because they change by turn right if you're if you're nimble enough as the german player you can take a snag at auto victory if you can make these very difficult uh, uh, acquisition of VP hexes, right? And that really forces you to take chances and lunge and, and do those big uh, lunging attacks that were probably, you know, that were pretty prevalent in, in the Eastern Front in the first part of the war, right? And so that, that was fascinating to me that you would kind of stretch your lines and push yourself out of supply almost and see if you can just grab that open town or grab that weakly defended town that hadn't been considered and can you get close enough to get those VPs. That was a fascinating part of the game that I really enjoyed. Uh, the OB I think is probably, you know, there's a lot of numbers on these counters I can't tell you. Uh, when I say numbers, you know, unit identifiers, I can't tell you if all the right divisions are there or not and frankly I don't really care. If, if there's a generic division that's a, a 115 or a 125, so be it, right? Uh, that's, I don't need to know that uh, Soviet Division 427 was in Odessa at any given time. Uh, com the conflict combat resolution stuff just to me is just a furball, a messy furball that I'm not happy about and could have been worded and done very differently. And I think that's going to that's going to carry, a, you're carrying that burden all the way through the game. And I don't know that it gets easier. Logistically, the game is pretty straightforward from a supply perspective in the early part of the game. And then it's not until you get into the later part of the game that we start to see these uh, potential uh, uh, difficulties for the Germans where you've got to pick an area that's going to be like a supply head and then push your, your, your main forces out from there and keep them in full attack supply and there's this whole concept of attack and defender supply that then starts to come into play. And that's really the meat of the game right there, once you get past the first four or five turns. Uh, probably good historical narrative, I don't know, I haven't got far enough into it. And uh, I, I think it. I think you could literally take the first map in terms of replayability, and you could play the opening assault many times, uh, probably solo, and it would probably be fun. And you just could play it as a one mapper and you know do some math on how far units could move for the Soviets and this make it a four play a four turn game with maybe just one map. I think it works that way. I, I set it up to have a look at it that way uh, <coughs> on my table. And the first three turns can really be played almost completely on the first map. Uh, so I think there's some good replay value here. Clearly, the designer thinks there's a good replay value because you need to play it 10 times to work the game out. And as I've already mentioned, the components. So the last big factor would be the digestibility of the rules. And that's where, once again, this thing just falls down on its knees. And I don't know that uh, I want to put any more effort into this to work it out. One of the reasons why I noticed this 7 to 1 max odds... No, hey, dude, you count all the way through to 18 to 1 and then count backwards. Rule is that I was starting to create a rule summary of my own to make the gameplay uh, more fluid and more uh, consumable because it is a monster game and you are moving a couple of hundred counters every turn and pretty much everything is going to move every turn, especially as the German. So... So I, I can't say these rules are digestible, and I can't really say that uh, the game is as easy and as fluid as it should be or could be for a monster game, particularly when we start looking at the likes of uh, monster games on the East Front, like uh, Case Blue and GB2 and uh, the Eastern Front series, uh, which would be an equivalent type of, of game in terms of scale of number of maps and pieces. Uh, so uh, it, it really falls short there for me. I, I think we're going to give this thing a rest and maybe come back to it. 
uh, once uh, our, our distaste with some of the uh, confusion in the wording of this. Yeah, this is a wording issue. If this was worded correctly, and hey, you know, the, and here's the, here's the one big thing that, that kind of the, the, the nail on the head was, I had a conver- an extended conversation on Facebook and uh, uh, with, with the designer, and there was no ability for him to accept that someone else might have a problem with the way the words were written. And all I was asking is saying, look, I don't understand. The, the words you have on the page do not say what you're saying. Can we just can we agree that someone might think that think differently than how you think? And that was not an option. And and that just frustrated the hell out of me. So so it's going away for now. Uh, I you know if you can get a copy cheap, I'd encourage you to have a look at it, and maybe you'll enjoy it a whole lot more than I will. I would love to hear from anybody who's played the campaign all the way through and tell us about the, the mid-game and how that works and what it looks like and, and what, the, what, what the fun level was like and what the, uh, the historical value was like there. And, and, and let us know, because I'd be very interested to hear that from, from all of you if there is uh, indeed... And I'm sure there are many people who have done it because I know there are some absolute uh, East Front crazy guys out there. So chip in and, and let us know what you think. Uh, Proud Monster Deluxe from Compass Games. There you go. Talk to you soon.